So why is this called a battery? And what does it have to do with an artillery battery, which is a group of missiles or cannons? Well, I'll tell you from shocking jars to Volta and beyond. Ready? Let's go. As soon as 40-year-old Benjamin Franklin built his first electricity machine, he became addicted to performing shocking electricity demonstrations, writing, my friends come continually in crowds to see them. I have, during some months past, had little leisure for anything else. One of the things that Franklin liked to use in these experiments was a little jar called a Leyden jar that could store electricity from the electricity machine and then give it later in a jolt. Being a thrill seeker, Franklin liked to use multiple jars at the same time to give a really good jolt. By 1749, Franklin started calling multiple Leyden jars a battery of Leyden jars, or an electric battery, as the jars reminded him of a battery of cannons. And the name stuck. In 1751, Franklin published a book of his letters about electricity and soon all of Europe was debating his ideas and recreating his fun experiments with particular interest in his theory that lightning was the same electricity as the shocks he was getting at home. Inspired by Franklin's book on May 10th, 1752, a retired soldier named Coffier, at the request of his landlord, Thomas Dalibard, who gets all the credit, verified this theory by getting sparks from a metal pole in a lightning storm in Marley, France. The Marley experiment caused international interest in scientists playing in electrical storms, including inspiring a married couple named Laura Bassi and her far less famous husband, Giuseppe Verratti, both of whom were independent physics professors at the University of Bologna, to become the first people in the papal state to catch lightning in a bottle. However, when they later tried to install lightning rods, there were riots and they had to take them down. Laura Bossi, who was prevented from teaching at the university due to her gender, taught her students the physics of Benjamin Franklin in her home. Safe from the rioting populace and the restrictive university, she set up an outdoor laboratory to study the effects of electrical storms. Actually, she set up two because they were so popular, she had to relocate to make enough room. One of the students pushing his way to see the amazing electrical results was a biology student named Luigi Galvani. In 1762, just after graduating, Luigi Galvani married a woman named Lucia Galliese, who was the daughter of the head of the science department and both Luigi and Lucia work full-time as Lucia's father's assistant. 12 years later, in 1774, Galvani's father-in-law died, and Galvani became a full professor and was finally required to do his own original research. Side note, in 1776, Laura Bossi was awarded Luigi Galvani's father-in-law's old position, making her not only the first female professor in modern history, but also the first female head of a science department. And she was finally, finally, finally allowed to teach in the university itself. Tragically, she ended up dying just two years later from a heart attack and is now often ignored by historians. Back to the Galvanis. In 1780, their work was poached by a rival. And so they turned to something that was new to them, the effect of electricity on biological systems. This is when Galvani's assistant accidentally discovered that electricity not only makes animals like frogs jump, also can make a dead frog jump. Amazed, the Galvani's then electrified every dead animal they could find and found that most could be moved with electricity, although the frog leg was the most easy to see. To be thorough, they created their own outdoor electricity laboratory to verify that dead frogs would jump in thunderstorms too. This is when they realized that sometimes the frog would jump on calm days, which is how Galvani discovered the metal in the wire holding the frog and the metal in the gate could make an electric shock and make the frog jump. Galvani went all Dr. Frankenstein about it and published the theory, form of which we believe to this day 
that electricity is the life force that causes all of us to function. His nephew Aldini took it even further in the Dr. Frankenstein department and actually electrified and animated dead bodies a few years later. Galvani published in 1791 and the scientific world was entranced and soon everyone was electrifying dead animals in what they were calling galvanic experiments, which is the origin of the term galvanized to mean, quote, shock or excite someone into taking action. Italy's premier electrician, Alessandro Volta, declared that Galvani's results were miraculous and dropped all of his research to focus on galvanic experiments. However, Volta soon found that he could get a living frog to jump by placing two different metals on the living frog. And he decided that the jumping frog leg had nothing to do with the living force. It only had to do with the power of the two different metals. And Volta then got into very public debates with Galvani's nephew about the nature of galvanism. Finally, in May of 1800, Volta produced a device that, in his words, combated, quote, the pretended animal electricity of Galvani. This device was a pile of zinc and silver with salt water soaked paper between them, which Volta found would give a shock okay, over okay. and over again shock without any the... rubbing Ooh, or yeah, electrical yeah. machine or thunderstorm or dead frog Linda. in sight. In fact, Volta had just invented the battery. Of course, he didn't call it the battery. Volta preferred the term artificial electric organ, which not having an opinion on. Not me, nope, nope, nope. Don't have an opinion on. Anyway, Volta's device was instantly popular. Not only was it useful to shock alive and dead bodies, it was quickly found that it could also be used in chemistry to electrically separate water into hydrogen and oxygen. Soon, multiple chemists and biologists were experimenting with what they called a galvanic pile. The first reference that I can find to calling Volta's device a battery came seven months later, in December of 1800, when a report on Volta's galvanic apparatus in France referred to Volta's device as la batterie, and it was translated into English as the battery in February of 1801. Four months after that, in June of 1801, a 22-year-old chemist named Humphrey Davy wrote an article about the galvanic apparatus of Mr. Volta where he too referred to this device as a, quote, galvanic battery. I mentioned Davy in particular because a few months after that, Davy was awarded the plum job as a lecturer at the Royal Institute of London, where he impressed British high society with his fabulous experiments, love of laughing gas, and startling good looks. A contemporary remembered that Davy's talks, quote, excited universal attention and unbounded applause, Compliments, invitations, and presents were showered upon him in abundance from all quarters. A few years later, Davy learned that he could make a bigger battery if he turned the pile on its side. And Davy built the world's largest battery in 880 square feet of the basement of the Royal Institution. Davy proceeded to use this battery to discover eight new elements and the first practical and ridiculously bright electric lamp. So why did scientists in the 1800s call a battery a battery? That was actually because of Volta. First, Volta came up with a name that no one liked. Second, in order to make his invention sound more impressive, he often compared it to the most powerful electric device available at that time, i.e. a bunch of Leyden jars, or as Ben Franklin put it, an electric battery. Like when Volta wrote, quote, my new instrument imitates the effects of the Leyden flask or of electric batteries. So to recap, Benjamin Franklin named a bunch of Leyden jars, a battery of jars, and inspired people to play in thunderstorm. Coffier got a spark in a thunderstorm for his boss Dalibard in France and inspired Laura Bossi in Italy to play with atmospheric electricity and teach Franklin's theories to Luigi Galvani. Galvani discovered that electricity could animate dead frogs, and so could two different metals. This inspired Alessandro Volta to get continuous electricity from a pile of metal and salt water, which he compared to a battery of Leyden jars. Finally, chemists started using batteries for electrical experiments, and some, like Humphrey Davy, called Volta's device a battery, and the name stuck because people thought Davy was cute and his science was top-notch. 
One small addendum. Humphrey Davy was so popular in the early 1800s that in 1813, as an Englishman, he was given permission by Napoleon Bonaparte himself to visit France and French-controlled Italy, even though they were in the height of the Napoleonic Wars. By 1814, Davy made his way to Como, Italy, and met the 69-year-old Volta, who gave Davy a gift of one of his original batteries, which is still on display at the Royal Institute. On this visit, Davy brought along his young, uneducated assistant, a man who Ernest Rutherford described as one of the greatest scientific discoverers of all time. That assistant's name? Michael Faraday. And that is why a battery is called a battery. What do you want me to do for the next video? Your choices are, why is an x-ray called an x-ray? Or why is helium gas called helium gas? Both of them are fabulous stories. You won't lose out either way. Put it in the comments. Thanks for watching my video. If you wanna know more about any of these people, I have a ton of videos about all of them. You don't know who Michael Faraday is. You don't know who Michael Faraday is? You better fix that. I have a bunch of videos about him too. Big thank you to my patrons. If you wanna be thanked too, there's a link down below. Don't forget, give me a thumbs up, share it on social media, subscribe, you know, you know the drill. Okay, thanks a lot and stay safe.